Hey guys, what is up? Welcome back to the channel. It is yours truly, Crystal Leander with the Ghost Girl Diaries podcast. Um, sorry we had some technical difficulties today. Um, full moon energies, man. You know, like sometimes you can't control what's going on. In fact, we're not uh, live on Facebook today. Usually we are. Uh, yeah, Streamlabs, which is the company that I go through, it's like an external site um, that allows you to stream to multiple places at once like literally it was like shutting down over and over again and it was like no you will not go live today <laughs> like literally so i'm um, sorry for the inconvenience this happens every once in a while i would say like once every six months i don't know if any of you guys out there like use um, twitch for like streaming purposes but i don't know why twitch does this like every 30 days they will like reset all of my auto sets I don't know why it like it pisses me off because like sometimes you'll go like six weeks and it's totally fine and there's like no issues and then one day like today you just log in and everything has like been reset and I'm like great it's fine you know um, but then today you know every once in a while we get these super rare instances where I can't even go live like it literally won't even let me go live so I've been sitting here trying to go live for like a hot minute so anyway i just wanted to um come on with elfie today i think her camera just went out so i'm gonna need just a minute to get her back on live she um dropped her uh, ipad earlier and she was worried she wasn't gonna be able to use it um elfie your camera went off i don't know if you know that it's fine i'll let you let you mess with it for a minute if you have to like end the call and call back we can do that too um so anyway guys welcome to the stream today today's gonna be a good chat with elfie and i it's gonna be a little bit more of like a true crime podcast i made a mistake um talking about btk today i actually um originally wanted to do a chat about robert Berdella. so i'm gonna i'm gonna like talk about him briefly in this stream as well um, there was a couple weeks ago, Elfie and I were streaming, and I was talking, somebody, um, in the Twitch channel asked me what I thought was, like, the darkest room inside of the Haunted Museum in Vegas, and I said BTK, I was wrong, um, I get BTK and Robert Berdella mixed up all the time because they're both from Kansas City, the, um, Robert Berdella, he was the Kansas City Axeman, or whatever he was, Kansas, I can't remember what his, like, um, his weird title was as like a serial killer but anyway um there's implements and items from robert berdella um and that room is like horribly dark horribly dark so i'm gonna talk about that too talk about that a little bit later um first i want to kind of chat about btk um one thing just some housekeeping stuff i want to chat about really briefly is um people are asking about the pilot i've had you guys i love you guys honestly I have had the most amazing feedback, not only on like YouTube comments, but I've had so many people tweeting at Kat and I both and tweeting at Ghost Girl Diaries and um, private DMs, direct messages on like um, Instagram. I have gotten the most amazing like love and feedback from you guys on the sizzle reel. I did post the trailer, which is like a short version. And then the sizzle reel is like a mini pilot. It's only like five minutes long. Um, people are asking, when is the pilot coming out? I have finally made a decision. Decision? Why do I, I don't know why I added that little like ugh, on the end. Um, I finally made a, a decision how I'm going to release it online. And I'm going to do an actual like mini video and post that on YouTube. Um, probably, I'm assuming, I think the video will be up tomorrow. It'll be a small video and talk about how I'm going to release the pilot. It will be released on YouTube, um, but not the conventional sort of way. So, anyway, in the meantime, where's my Elfie at? Where's my girl Elfie at? Is, is Elfie in the house? I should be here. Hopefully it's all working now. <laughs> <laughs> it, it must be the full moon, because, like, Elfie had an issue with her iPad, and then I was like... 
I was like ready to go. I was like, just take your time, Elfie. And then all of a sudden my, my stream was like, no, actually you're not ready to go, by the way. <laughs> and El like, dude. <laughs> go ahead. Okay. Oh, she threw or her, your iPad fell off of like, you had like a spring holder for your iPad and she said it broke right before the stream. I have an armature for it. I really like it. And like I set everything up and I walk away to get coffee. I come back in and it's like, luckily it didn't fall far. It fell on the table. I'm like, are you kidding me? <laughs> are you kidding? It's true. I'm telling you, the new moon, man, or the full moon, full moon energies. It feels good today. It's been a good day. So are you excited about BTK? We kind of talked about this a little bit yesterday, and we were both watching, like, interviews of BTK. I watched interviews of his kids. What's your, like, first, like, impression of just BTK as, like, a person? Which, by the way... His official name, that's that's his serial killer name. His official name is Dennis Lynn Raider. If you guys haven't heard of BTK, he was a big serial killer. We'll we'll get more into depth on this. What's your what's your opinion on just him as a person? It I mean, I think in some ways, like you look at him, he's probably like the essential like serial killer everyone thinks about as the next door guy i mean i looked at him and it's like he looks like he could have been one of my like substitute teachers or like i got gym teacher vibe or like i did just, too <laughs> i felt yeah, that I way yeah <laughs> like his just, glasses mm -hmm. and just like do next door and it's like it's not even a matter of like he was so quiet it was more like he just doesn't at least I've, I I have no desire to ever like stand anywhere near him. But at least through the photos, he doesn't really put off a vibe of like the prison photos. Yes, but like regular photos and stuff. When you see like him and like every day, it's not exactly a creep vibe. It's more like he just kind of fades into the background vibe. It's true because like you look at pictures, just pictures of Richard Ramirez, even photos when he's not like in court and you just like can see in his eyes like that saying like the eyes are the window of the, of the soul and you you look in Richard Ramirez's eyes and you just know something's not right there and BTK does have that vibe of like now Ted Bundy has that vibe too but like mm -hmm. when he gets crazy you can see the crazy in his eyes you know what I mean but like you can see where like they would put on a total like front versus other people like even I, I don't know in my opinion John Wayne Gacy doesn't really pass somebody that I would just trust on the street <laughs> you know what I mean like he's not one I would be like oh I trust you like I would say BTK somebody where I just like that's just some dude walking by same with Ted Bundy but he, he looked like someone like you would pass by like Home Depot or something as he's getting his tools or whatever and you wouldn't think twice of oh he's just doing home repair <laughs> he's Not just doing home repair from <laughs> serious honestly mm -hmm. so, so probably if i put in front of him had a conversation i'd be like okay something's not quite right i don't know what <laughs> So he was born in March 9th of 1945. I'd love to do um, Zodiac on all this stuff. Like I've talked to you, I think I'm going to do some Zodiac astrology readings on them for future YouTube readings just because I think it'd be interesting. But March 9th is obviously Pisces season. Pisces are waters, uh, you know, water signs. They're known for being more muted, go with the flow type of people. But um, he was born in a small town, you know, near sort of like Kansas City, Kansas, Kansas City, Missouri. My mom grew up in Kansas City, Missouri. I'm familiar with Kansas City, Missouri. I know that like it is the Midwest, but it's still a very, it still has somewhat like, su you know, southern vibes, I guess you could say. Um, which is everybody leaves their door open, everybody trusts everybody, it's like safe. And, and you know, it, it, that's why I always get him and Robert Berdella mixed up because they both came from like that same Midwestern sort of area, you know. But with BT, okay. go ahead. Um, chill and everything that everyone, every neighbor knows every neighbor's what's going on with them. Exactly. Everything. Well, like there were even interviews that I was looking through of like people that were literally his neighbor talking about like they would have never suspected this happening because like they've known him and his family like their whole life and like yeah. he never gave like those and then you have other neighbors that when he became an adult 
they would spy on him and they would see him wearing women's clothes because he had these like weird rape fantasies weird fantasy things happening and they would actually report it to police so it's interesting as a child he was viewed pretty normal and i i actually dug into some of his past and i was because he has three other brothers i believe and i was okay. looking up like information on the brothers to see like was there was there like torture that happened you know, like usually when you have i wouldn't say always like, but i would say most of the time no go ahead elfie oh i was gonna say like if there's like family history either like they had something when they grew up or if something happened to them as well usually there's abuse that runs down the line and i was reading about the other brothers and like nothing happened like they were very much just a southern midwest family normal and like nothing nothing to be alarmed by and <laughs> the bro in fact there is one brother that still does interviews once in a while about btk his brother and there's one brother that is still to this day in utter 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 denial that his um brother like did all of these like horrible killings i'm gonna be honest when i started researching btk i didn't realize that he had killed two kids oh yeah uh, they were like his first too yeah it was a family it was a little boy and a girl that was like nine or eleven or something i am that shocked that's pretty like that's pretty big because like normally when you read about serial killers it's like it's by chance or it's something small like a little thing they do they either like kill one person and it's usually by just they like, almost testing the waters but this one he just he broke into a house and he went for the whole family he did and like, like there's two things that i'm noticing though like with this it, one is they always go through open windows and doors are you picking up on that with serial killers mm. lock well, your damn doors people breaking in or uh well with his what's interesting is he just knocked on their door and even in his uh interviews or his uh court thing he was talking about how he liked to role play like characters like uh telephone people or electric people or someone to get into the house essentially mm -hmm. and he utilized he really did utilize that whole I don't look intimidating thing. I mm -hmm. think he really t used that to his advantage. He did. Well, the first house he broke into, one of the kids let him in because, once again, you're talking about... He was about 20 when this happened, the first the first family, and then he sort of went dormant for about a decade. So this was like in the 60s was the first family. And he knocked on the door, and one of the kids, it was a mom, a dad, and, um, two kids that live at, living at home. One of the kids let him in. He had a pistol. He walks in. He binds the whole family up and like he won it. He like drug it out. So now you watched this interview, right? From court. Mm -hmm. So this interview Elfie and I watched and I, I'm pretty sure I posted it on social media in a few different places. Um, yeah. He's bra he, he's essentially, I don't want to say he's bragging because he's not really bragging. He's in court. He's admitting to his crimes and he is so like nonchalant. Mm -hmm. Like the the, oh. the 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 judge is like, so so tell me what you did, sir. You know, and he's like, well, and he does this like that mouth thing. Well, you know, like oh. I mean, he like he's a little ashamed, but not really. You know. Yeah. What well, was it was like I I listened to the audio of the the court case thing, and it's like, I think I was like replaying it and everything. It's it's almost like he was he's just telling about the weather or like I did this thing on this weekend and just giving a report and not really putting much emotion into it like you normally think like someone's going to be like like rubbing their hands go yes and I did this and then I did this he's like no nah, I bind them up and I did this and this didn't work so I tried this just nonchalant and then he was it. like yeah the, the they were complaining about you know it hurt that I had them bound. And so I, I, let, I loosened the restraints a little bit. And, and another thing that I've noticed with serial killers is, I mean, they always say they watch their victims for like a while before they make their move. Mm -hmm. And they always say they pick weak people on purpose. People that like aren't paying attention to their surroundings. And I, I, a lot of people, I'm not saying all victims of serial killers or survivors of serial killers, but a lot of them don't fight back. And I feel like that is proof. Like there are two adults in the house and your children. While he was tying up one of them, 
the other should have like grabbed a knife or something. I don't know. Like I would go out even being shot, at least knowing I was going out, like trying. You know what I mean? Well, I think what with the uh, with that one, it was also he he came in. I think he that was the one where he role played that he was a escape criminal and he was just trying to get a car or food or something and he. He played up where he was just telling them, I'm just going to tie you up or bind you up, and then I'm going to grab the car and grab the food and go. And just, like, try to play it off. Like, I'm not going to do anything else. As long as you cooperate with me, we're just going to tie up. But it's still strange to me that two adults didn't, weren't able to overcome him or something, or he was able to to do that. And also the fact that I think the dad was the one who had a bruised rib that he actually adjusted and put padding underneath because the guy had a bruised rib mm-hmm. and he's like yeah the guy had like busted ribs so i kind of dressed it so he was more comfortable like, i know that was so weird but i think it was him trying to a lot of them he would always say i'm just going to tie you up and do this he he would just make sound like we're just going to do this and then i'm out of here mm-hmm. and then he goes the full extra mile yeah he's in this if you guys get a chance even to watch like 10 minutes of the interview or like scroll in halfway or something just to watch a little bit but he's like yeah you know he had bruised ribs and like he was uncomfortable and so you know i I, I wanted to make him more comfortable and i'm like why you're going to kill him why like now you feel bad because he feels uncomfortable you know what i mean what i I don't yeah because like you can tell he doesn't have he doesn't have empathy for people mm-hmm. but he it's it's i don't know if this this part of his like well i'm supposed to react like this because the person is hurting like this just kind of reacting and not necessarily thinking actually i i have any care for this person it's more like oh i have bruised ribs okay we'll just do this then right it's very strange it's very strange um and i'm sorry i think they actually had more children because it says um in the like the list that i sent you there were three other kids that were the ones that actually found the family that was murdered. So it was a bigger family um, that I yeah, thought. Yeah, I think it is. And then, like, I think, like, a 15-year-old came home the next day and found them. Then was the one who found them and oh, whatnot. It's a mess. So, you know, going back to his childhood briefly, I was trying to dig up, like Elfie said, most of the time when you have people that, like, don't mind causing pain, inflicting pain, murdering people, like, no no empathy, no heart, like, whatsoever, usually they've suffered from, like, a really bad, like, maybe molestation, maybe, who knows what's what's happening, and so I looked into it, and he was just kind of a, a bad egg, in my opinion. His brothers came out normal, and he always had, like, rape fantasies, fantasies of weird things, role-playing, and he started by um, killing, like, stray animals, and that makes me sick. I hate that. I mean, I hate people oh. being murdered, too, but I hate animal torture. I was listening to something when they started that. I'm like, I had to fast forward and like, nope. I can't. I know where- yep. I, I cannot listen to somebody on the stand talking about how they murdered a cat or a dog. I can listen to people being <laughs> murdered, <laughs> but I can't listen to the animal torture, you know? Yeah, I just... just mm. I, can't, I know, it's sick. What's wrong with you, man? You I just- don't know, it's... I was listening even to a podcast. They're like, yeah, he started his childhood and everything. And I'm like, fast forward because I know where this is going. I don't need to listen. No, I didn't even want to read about the details of it, honestly, because it's just like you need a lot of Jesus, like so much Jesus that like I don't think there's enough Jesus on this planet to help you. You know what I mean? What's even weirder is I think at his closing statement, which was apparently a very long closing statement. He even mentioned like, oh, yeah, I love animals. I have some pets of my own. I love I'm like what i know what (laughs) no you no (laughs) so now it's interesting because when i was listening to um some of his you know discussion because i kind of fast forward it like you did because like he honestly like serial killers make you want to throw up i mean it's weird because for as much as i want to like be involved in paranormal and i love true crime when i'm hearing about them boast about their stories and what they did to humans and animals like it literally makes me my empath is like dying on the inside you know what i mean what was strange was like i think he even mentioned so the only thing he mentions of any trauma of a child is like he's like i think i might have been dropped on my head as a kid 
I would agree with that statement. That that's the only thing he meant. I think he really mentions of like anything he because he was like, I'm not sure why. Maybe I was like dropped on my head, or I think that might have happened. But yeah, yeah it's like just. He started the usual route you hear of starting small with animals and then moving his way up. I just, I just can't. So now he did say he feels like there were two personalities inside of him. He says Mm -hmm. he was able, the reason like his friends and family and people around him didn't know this other side was he felt like he had a split personality essentially is what he's saying. And that the other side was his like sadomasochism, dark, like torturous sexual fantasies you know there's one one side of like just kink and then there's like a whole nother side of like what he took it to and it's not even like the sado stuff like it's even going further than that where it's like no like i don't want to like do this for fun and re-roll play tomorrow i want you to be dead by then <laughs> oh yeah well i mean because that's the thing because i know there's some that try to like take it in the wrong direction it's like there's there's a difference between there are people who have kink of of fantasies of violent fantasies but they know there's the reality in the fantasy and not to take it past that fantasy not to bring it into reality or anything right. and he he's to decide oh no this is not good enough the fantasy is not good i have to actually do it well that's what i guess i don't get is like it, it to me it wasn't just like sadomasochism or like sexual fantasies in my opinion mm-hmm. because if that were the case he would have found a spouse or someone that he could reenact that with he was literally looking for strangers to kill yeah, I. That's the thing. I don't know if he like, if he thought he didn't think there was any, like he was just too weird. It was too dark, and he just figured that it was he had to release it somehow, and that was apparently his way of thinking. And it's like. What? Well, what? the other strange part of this, though, is that he's known for wearing, like, female masks. And they were creepy masks, by the way. They weren't, like... I mean, I know this is, like, 60s, 70s, 80s, but still, they were damn creepy masks. And he oh, would... The, yeah. Like, he would dress yeah. in women's clothes, and he would essentially have, like, negotiations with himself as, like, one female and then, like, the male side of him... And that's, like, not even role play to me. Like, you're doing it with yourself. Like, I don't get, like, I don't understand. So, but in his mind, if he thinks he literally had a split personality, he's having full-blown conversations with himself. And it, it, in a way, it reminds me of Ted Bundy because there were several occasions in negotiations with Ted Bundy and even when he was confessing to murders that Ted Bundy said, like, there is me who is, like, the lawyer, um, attorney, student, college student, professional student, handsome young man but there is a demon that resides in me and when that demon takes over i can't stop it i can't control it so it it, go ahead oh i was gonna say that's that's some of it i feel i wonder if that's more when they're trying to justify their actions that it's not it's the essentially the devil made me do it it wasn't me it's it's this other personality it's this other darker side i can't control it i can't but uh, BTK it, it, didn't say it was, like, the devil made him do it. He just was like, yeah, this other personality is it's what it enjoys and I can't stop it. Like, he was, like, very, like, nonchalant. Like, yeah, this is just what it is. Where Ted yeah, well, Bundy, I do think he had a little bit more, like, shame in it. But once again, you're looking at split personalities. Is it, like, you know, it's no longer called schizophrenia. It's now called disassociative identity disorder, which basically yeah. means you can have split personalities or more than one personality. Or, like I've said before, sometimes with bipolar, if you get a manic episode, which is what I think Ted Bundy was, you get a manic episode if you're a very violent bipolar one, which those that does exist, you, like, black out, you don't know what you're doing, you get, like, a lot of courage, a huge adrenaline rush, um, uh, it's like a high, you're you're getting, like, all this serotonin released, your brain is, like, releasing chemicals at, like, a high-speed pace and you can't control it and then like i think that's when ted bundy would get this anger and it would take him over and he would kill these women and like chop their head off and like they would have yeah exactly and that was what i think is the bipolar side now do i think btk was bipolar no i do think he may have had this associative identity disorder though especially if he's dressing in women's clothes well the only problem with the disassociated identity disorder is usually the that as far as i know because uh, there's, it's still a lot of research, and it's, it's not quite as clear on the the total about it. 
or how it works. But as far as I know, usually it comes about due to some sort of trauma. Mm-hmm. Some trauma in the brain compartmentalizes and tries to basically keep itself safe by separating, like either creating another personality or creating or just separating itself from the trauma. And as far as we know, he never said, I experienced this kind of trauma, which created this personality or created this identity to cope with it. Thank Unless you for the bits, Nikita. We appreciate you. Sorry, someone cheered for us. Yay! Unless he is saying that he he created this or he, he allowed this personality to come through that is his way to cope with this darkness that he was trying to battle with and that's where the split happens but that's still it, it I don't think it was it would be it's not like it's a absolute something takes over and he has absolutely no control of it 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 is in full control it is still him so is tr- I have a family that. member that has uh, disassociative identity disorder okay I don't want to say who it is because I've never disclosed that before because I respect my family's wishes to not be public on their lives. Um, This person has disassociative identity disorder and my family chooses not to be medicated, Mm. Um, which is free will. I mean, and this person lives in, in, in my opinion, pure hell because they are comfortable living with multiple personalities. Um, They're older, so they grew up in a time where mental health wasn't a positive discussion. It's not something like you should take care of yourself. Um, It's more of a I don't want to go to the loony bin type of discussion when it's like, but if you could get medicated correctly, you would feel better. Imagine not having to hear those voices or hear hallucinations or everything around you. I'm not so sure if BTK is full um, disassociative identity disorder either, which is, you know, I do think he could be split personality, though. Because usually when you're disassociated, you have more than one, and it's definitely due to childhood trauma, which my family member that has it had severe childhood trauma, um, and they were, like, left alone for days as, like, a three-year-old. And what ends up happening is when you're a three and you cannot fend for yourself, like my family member was... Um, severe neglect, not, not, not even abuse. It doesn't even have to be abuse. It doesn't have to be molestation or anything like that. It's just severe neglect. Um, what ends up happening is your brain is so underdeveloped that it, do, it, the brain's a crazy organ, guys. Like it starts developing and doing things to try to repair itself. So you have this little three-year-old that's having just horrendous trauma being left alone for days without anybody, without help with food, without help to go to the bathroom, not locked in a cage. It wasn't that kind of circumstance. They just did, they just had to fend for themselves at three. And it's scary living by yourself in a huge home. And, you know, as a child, you're already afraid of the monsters under the bed, but imagine having no adult to go to to get help. And what ends up happening is the brain repairs itself by creating characters in your brain. And these people really identify them as actual human beings in their head. Like, there's several human beings. So every time trauma happens, a new person is created in your brain. Now, that's severe childhood trauma. Did BTK go through trauma? Obviously not. Um, There have been some rare instances where uh, schizophrenia can be inherited, but it's more likely to happen when you're, like if you have both parents that have it, there's a chance you could get the gene because now it's been an altered gene in your DNA. Now, and you're both, your parents had it, they had you, you know, so it could happen. But in BTK's case, he didn't have that, that happen. But for him to be so dark and his three other brothers end up okay, and he, yeah, and it's one of those like. I I guess that's honestly when when people talk about serial killers and talk about true crime stuff, and it comes back to that the psychology of like nature versus nurture and and where where did it where did it happen where was the click or where did the the switch happen or where did he decide this would be a thing. He is a rare breed, though, in my opinion, because with serial killers, and and we can name off several others, obviously, John Wayne Gacy was abused by his dad, hit because he um, wanted to wear women's clothing. Nobody knows if he was um, cross-dressing, transgender, or just gay, but he couldn't be himself. 
So he was severely abused by his dad, so he reenacted that same abuse on children. I'm not saying that's okay, but that's how the brain psychologically works. It's amazing. And then you have Richard Ramirez, who witnessed a murder at a young age, had severe abuse. He reenacts that on his victims. He disrespects women, so there must have been some mommy issues going on there. And then you have BTK, and you're like, damn, dude, what happened? You're just a bad egg. Oh, yeah, it's just, like you say, he's a rarity, and it's it's also, like I said, it's fascinating that he's just very, very matter-of-fact about it. Mm-hmm. He's like, yep, and he even, when you listen to the hours of testimony, um, I, he talks, he actually breaks it down, his own, his own killings, he actually breaks it down. Mm-hmm to the textbook of this is how a serial killer works this is what i did here's the steps i took and everything Mm -hmm. which is so crazy because i have he so he grew up in wichita kansas which is i have family in wichita kansas kansas city kansas and kansas city missouri and Mm -hmm. it's just so strange because like i've been there so many times and it's still very, like, small-town vibes. You know what I mean? Like, it's nothing like Vegas. It's not like Vegas. Like, Vegas is big city, modernism, casinos, brothels are still here. And then you go to somewhere like that, and you're like, dang, like, this guy is in the middle of nowhere, like, doing this crazy shit to people, you know? So I, very can, I can see why it shook up, you know, the town or, or even just the Midwest in general. So he has three brothers, Paul, Bill, and Jeff. And they all said they had very normal lives growing up. And like I said, one of them is still in total denial that he did what, it, which it makes, that makes, pisses me off. Like your brother testified on, on court stand and talked about what he did with these murders. Like if you don't care about the women that were involved or like the parents of the kids, at least have some compassion that he murdered two children. Mm-hmm. And instead, you're in utter denial that your brother could do that. Like, what's wrong with you? Like the disrespect when he admitted to it. Oh yeah, he spoke fully, and the, it sounds like the guy's like, nope. The, and it's like okay, you're going to deny. It. There's no way around that. I have a quote from his brother that I wanted to share. He said, "I can't believe my brother did it, but if he did, may God have mercy on his soul." Mm. Yeah, he did, boo. He admitted it. Like. Came from the horse's mouth. <laughs> I, I know. So it's just, it's crazy to me. So um, I also watched a couple of interviews too. BTK has two daughters. Is that right? Uh, yes, I believe so. And I, I, go ahead. So what his daughter that does, had did an interview or had done a documentary about growing up with him and everything. And she was shocked too. She didn't, she's like, my mom had no idea. No one had a clue like what was going on. That's, that's the thing that still surprises me. Like that. Because he, he had souvenirs, he had photos, he had mementos. Now, granted, he probably kept them very much lock and key hidden away in, in probably in such a way where it's like, this is dad's stuff, you don't touch dad's stuff. Mm-hmm. But it's still like, not a hint, not a clue, not a, or just like, nothing? Really? Well, nothing? the only thing I could think of is, I mean, he was born in the 40s, like, his first murders were in the 60s, then, like, you kind of skip a decade, go into, like, late 70s, 80s, when his, like, sexual fantasies start, like, popping back up again. And mm. honestly, I still feel like that's a time where people are playing housewife a little bit. Well, I think, I think his first murders, his first murders, I think, were bef- before his marriage, or just around his marriage, yep. and then and then he had kids, and there was a lag, and then his next murder. There was killed. a lag? <laughs> okay, so there was a lag. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, that's the interesting part, where there is, like, blocks of time, because, like, you've seen with our serial killers, it's usually, like, every couple of months, or every six months, or every year, they have to they have to reenact this, this, this fantasy in their head through a new murder. But he can go, like, almost half a decade mm-hmm. with nothing. So from the horse's mouth again, he said, I, ha- I harbor sadistic sexual fantasies about torturing, trapping helpless women and then killing them. So once again, it's not even, a, in my opinion, about the sex part. It's about, like, the killing part. And when he was on the stand talking about one of the women that he murdered, he had basically bound her, kept her bound, and then 
she was sort of like trying to like identify with her captor in a way of like hey don't kill me like i'm i want to like be friends with you and then she like asked him to go to the bathroom he let he unbound her let her go to the bathroom and then she came out and was like let's just get it over with and he was like okay and so and then he just like it's just it's strange Oh yeah, I mean, I think with one he even sat with her, and because she wanted to have a smoke, and they sat, had a smoke, talked, and then just proceeded after that. Very just like, yep, now we're going to do the thing. Because yeah, a couple of them were like, because they thought he was just he was. He told them what he was going to do, and they thought that was it. You get it done because I think I even heard once, one interview they talked about saying like, get it done over with, so I can go call the cops. And then he and another thing and I don't want to I'm not going to go into gory details because and I'm not going to use certain words because we're not going to here um but you know he would dress up as a woman and wear a women's mask and he was into something called autoerotic asphyxiation is basically where he chokes himself while he's doing the dirty with himself Mm -hmm. and um can you imagine like him passing out in women's clothes and a mask and like his wife walks in I mean, there's, like, there's photos, like, they show, there are Polaroid photos that he took of himself, like, mm. dressed up, bound up, doing, doing all that stuff. <laughs> doing all that. <laughs> Elvie's like, whatever, doing that stuff, weirdo. It is. It's like, I can't tell where the photos are, like, if they were in his basement or if they were somewhere else, because, yeah. How his wife never walked in on any of this, I have no idea. See, I agree. I agree. Well, and they're talking about him having ropes and bindings, and for they were ropes for his neck, ropes for his legs, ropes for his arms. That that's not small stuff. And like, if you like, let's think about it. Okay, today, if you want any erotica stuff, you go to Amazon.com. You get it shipped to you in two days. Back then, you would have had to really hunt that shit down and like find a store that had that specific stuff. Like, how did, the- how was none of it found by his wife? Even, like, the ropes and the binds and stuff. You know what I mean? Well, from the looks of most of the stuff he had, you could probably get at, like, a hardware store. Mm-hmm. So, like, if you hunt down at hardware store, you can get the various different kinds of ropes and bindings and everything. And I I could see where he probably kind of hid it. Because he it sounded like he did security, he did maintenance, he did, like, hands-on stuff. Mm-hmm. So he probably could hide it with the... This, this material is just for maintenance or garage stuff or something because I'm just going to the hardware store. That's and you, the- that I- creeped me out. You think about that, him working as, like, a maintenance worker. Like, I mean, I just had construction workers in my house, you know? Like, you don't even know who people are that are coming in. Like, you think about that, and you're like, and you have to get, like, the hole in your wall fixed. Like, you're innocently, like, trying to find. And he was probably scoping people out while he was doing work for them. Oh, he, he, he even said himself that he would, uh, he said he would stalk and troll people for, like, weeks. Like, he would, he would be very meticulous. He would watch them for weeks. He would watch their patterns. He would watch their goings in and out of their house and everything. And I think one of the big things, I guess, that caused fear when people started hearing about this is that he would first cut their phone line. Mm-hmm. And when there were still landlines. He would cut their phone line first before he even would either break into the house or he would come to the house. And he was in court, like, nonchalant. Like, well, the first thing I always did was cut the phone line. Like, no shame. Oh, yeah. Well, he even, like, posed as a uh, phone repair guy. He he told someone he, I can't remember which one it was, but he told them that, like, oh, I need to take a look at your wires or phone line or something in your house. And he was, he had the whole outfit. Apparently, he was able to get the whole outfits. That's the ones I was. That is he, some methodical planning, man. Like, that's exhausting. He even put together, like, tool bags of, like, this is what I need for this thing. And it, it sounds like almost like it would be different every time. Where he'd, like, knives, guns, ropes, everything he needed. He would have a little tool bag of it. His brain is messed up. So the murders were January 15th, 1974. Four members of the Otero family were murdered in Wichita, Kansas. The victims were Joseph Otero, who was the dad. He was 38. Julie Otero, who was 33, which is the mom. Joseph Jr., who was 9. And Josephine. Well, that's a lot of Josephines and Josephs. 
Um, and Josephine was 11. Their bodies were discovered by the oldest children who had been at school at the time of the killings. Well, bless their heart. Imagine they're still living and with all this trauma. Um, their family died. It's so sad. So he was arrested in 2005. He is still alive. Um, and he confessed to that murder. Um, he was also one of those that liked to write letters to the police. And he liked to be, like, all cryptic. Oh, yeah. No, he loved... Um bragging to the media and to the police of what he did and everything and like actually I had to look up when we first started this because I'm like wait is this guy still alive and I looked up I'm like I didn't realize he didn't get captured until 2005 I mm -hmm. thought he was like captured in the 90s or something mm -hmm. and it's just I lost my train of thought it, well because it's so dark I mean it's I just, I'd sell her with this. I don't know why. <laughs> See, that's what happens when we start researching serial killers. You just go down like a really dark rabbit hole. No, you were talking about how um, all of these murders are happening, and then he finally got caught in 2005. You didn't know that he was still alive, and you're like, wow, he's still alive. It's 2005 is when he gets caught, so he's gone his whole life without being being caught, which is why he his kids were so shocked that he was a part of this, because they were like, he was always the perfect dad. People in town even described him as being normal polite and educated well i think his last murder that he actually did because i guess he he tried to take credit for a couple of them that ended up not being his was like in 1991 and then he stopped for whatever reason and then got captured in 2005 when he started taunting the police again for some reason but i think somewhere in there it was I guess he was planning to start over again or start up again and everything, and they just caught him before he could do anything. Well, he released a poem publicly, too, and it was called Oh, Death to Nancy. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and what, this also goes into discussing about, like, serial killers, um, particularly Richard Ramirez, who was, like, literally watching himself on TV on, like, primetime news. Like, everyone was so excited that, like, the Night Stalker, it made him excited. It made him want to do more. So, I, honestly, I think immediate, we can definitely infinitely say and, and try to not make more m mistakes like we've had from the past, which is the media publicizes these serial killers so much to, like, in their own head, they think they're a celebrity. And they're, like, oh, yeah. they're powerful. And, like, ooh, like, they gave me the name BTK. Or, like, ooh, they gave me the name Night Stalker. Like, ooh, like, I'm powerful. Like, I got my own nickname. And then somebody that's, like, in a sadistic brain... Mm -hmm. They're going to take it and run with it. And, like, that's even, like, Richard Ramirez. Remember, they said after that mayor of, like, San Francisco or San, San Diego, whichever it was, she released a bunch of information. And then Richard Ramirez went on, like, an extra killing spree over the next few weeks because um, he knew that they were hot on his trail. And he was, like, it, it's, like, that catch and thrill, like, game of excitement, adrenaline rush, which, once again for me goes with like somewhat of a manic episode or something like that like you're, you get all these like adrenaline rushes that you want to you have all this energy and you don't know what to do with it and like your sick brain is like let's go freaking murder a bunch of people and break in their homes so well, I think it falls into that idea he really liked having power over people he liked holding power and so I think that's part of the reason why he liked saying that stuff to the police and to the media because to him it was a power trip of like I I'm still out you can't get me, but I'm going to taunt you with all this information, and you can't really do anything about it. Mm -hmm. And he just, he was, he enjoyed power trips. Like, mm -hmm. he was big on that. His final victim, which the rest of the women, there, there's other women that were involved, but his final victim was February 1st of 1991. And mm -hmm. uh, her name was Dolores, and she was actually murdered January 19th, but she wasn't found till February 1st. Yeah, and they also it was interesting how his victims were older, like the last ones were older compared to the ones he first had, which were much younger and everything. And I think that might have been just because he could overpower them easier or it was easier to overpower them since they were older compared to because he was not a young men at that point. I also think... And I'm not, I, I'm not the, I'm, I'm a millennial, but I'm not the kind that racks other generations. I don't like people that do that. I don't fight with baby boomers. Like, I don't care. Like, I just think it's stupid. Because you have to remember every generation has gone through different trauma. Like, we all have different trauma with how we grew up, you know? Like, 
my generation has been through like Iraq and Afghanistan war like we have our own trauma you know like but my point is is like his generation of trauma um Mm. and that older generation didn't especially women is what I'm getting at they Mm. weren't taught to fight back like women empowerment like feminism movements wasn't a thing and like you know it's like a man comes in your house with a pistol I would like I would rip his eyeballs out like I'm gonna do whatever I can to like get away like I'm not I'm gonna go out kicking and screaming I've, I've said it before to like cat like if anybody ever finds my body just be like wait till you see the guy that she got because he's like in pieces as well you know what I mean like but in that generation they were taught like and we're still coming out of that how many times have you heard people on social media be like why do women apologize all the time and I'm mm-hmm. guilty of it. You go to the store, you run into a guy. Oh, I'm sorry, even though he's the one that ran into you with his fat ass. But I'm the one apologizing because I'm a polite female. And I really think that's what contributed all these years is like you you unlock your door. You live in the Midwest. You're trying to just have like a cozy, comfortable life. You, you Somebody walks in with a gun. Oh, I can't fight back. Like I've been taught by society I'm not strong enough to take on a man, so I'm just going to sit here and take it, get raped, and, like, do what he says so that I don't get shot. But then you end up dying anyways. So I guess that's my point with why I would fight. But also, there weren't self-defense classes then. I think it's it's not even, like, not even having a gun. He always, it sounds like he most of the time dressed as someone of authority. Mm-hmm. Someone who who you would listen to to take orders or something, or I take orders, but, like, I, I'm i coming here to do this, and you're like, okay, like you said, like, the, the fear of, like, you had construction workers in your place, and they're just coming in, they're doing their thing, and they're saying, yep, I we're doing this, this, and this. Mm-hmm. And if they're in a certain uniform, you don't, your brain doesn't go, like, I should question this. More like, yep, you're doing this. Mm-hmm. So he sometimes didn't even need the gun. He just, like, I'm coming here to fix this, work on this, or need to do this. And they're like, oh, okay. Mm-hmm. And it makes sense. It's even when you look at it, like some people are like, well, why did he let him in? Well, he was he posed as an electrician and probably didn't give off any vibes of anything other than that. And that's more proof of saying that in that time, it wasn't. I mean, nowadays, like, you know, the population has grown, societies have grown. You know, like Las Vegas, there's a few million people that live here when that never used to be a thing, like back in the 60s and 70s. You're growing up in Midwest Wichita. There can't be a lot of people in the 60s, 70s, 80s. Why wouldn't you just trust somebody to walk in? Why wouldn't you trust to just leave your door unlocked? You know what I mean? Like, you've been taught, like, oh, it's small town. Like, we're safe. No one would hurt us. And it sucks because you don't, nobody wants to prepare for their death or prepare for an assault and, you know, to to come in here and get ya. You know what I mean? Like, nobody wants to think about that. And it just, it's sad and and it's, um, it's horrible, honestly. I'm just, I'm glad that I am a millennial and I grew up when I did. Yeah, we keep doors locked and, like, uh, everything's locked. It's like, who are you? What do you want? (laughs) When when I'm still expecting somebody, I, like, run and hide. Like, I'm like, oh, shit, I forgot. Like, the guy was, (laughs) you know what I mean? Like, well, and I live in, like, a gated, guarded community 24-7. So, like, I, I mean, I have extra, extra security. But that's a lot of Vegas is like that. But, I mean, yeah, I would never. I told you, like, growing up with my aunt, she'd leave the door unlocked and the windows unlocked. And I'd be like, I mean, we're, yeah, we're in Colorado suburbs. But, damn, no. I could, never, I could never feel comfortable. I mean, like, even if I'm in the house, it's still locked up just because, like, no, just no. Well, my uncle was a veteran, and he owned a lot of guns, so I think that was in their brain of, like, oh, we're safe, he's a veteran, he owns guns. But still, they'd go to sleep with their doors unlocked and windows open, like, wide open. Oh, no, no. Like, I, mean, I, I remember, like, I'm just going to be, we're just going to no. get to know Crystal for a second, okay? There'd be some <laughs> nights Crystal would be a little drunk in my 20s, you know what I'm saying? And, like, I'd lose my keys or something, and I I always knew I didn't have to call my aunt. I just show up, I walk in her door, no matter what time, and I go to the guest bedroom and sleep. Like, I just knew, you know what I mean? Like, I didn't even need a key. But, like, looking back, like, that is so dangerous. Like, please don't do that. Like, literally, you know? Um, oh, yeah. Okay, so legal proceedings, February 28, 2005. He was charged with 10 counts of murder, um, and he just started, you know 
blabbing about what he did and like no shame whatsoever. So the the ages of his victims, Joseph Ochera, 39, Julia, 33, Joseph Jr. was nine years old. That's horrible. When you see, the nine year old was suffocated with a plastic bag. What, what kind of monster are you to like, what gives you the right to play God to think you can take someone else's life? You know, like I wish he'd meet his maker. Um, the other kid, Josephine, female, she was 11. She was hanged by a rope, an 11 year old child. What kind of yeah. demon does that? Like, I'm sorry, but, I mean, you have to be pretty dark to, to take an innocent child and do that well, to them. He took her down in the basement and did that. And just, it, it, that, to me, was just, like, next level, like, uh, yeah. I'm shocked he's still alive in prison because they don't like children that are murdered you know what i mean like they do not because they have grandchildren nieces nephews like yeah i was a drug dealer yeah i killed somebody but like i wouldn't harm a child so i'm shocked he's oh. still alive no they put him in solitary confinement because they basically for that thing because they knew if they let him out in the general populace he would not last long no he wouldn't um another one he killed was a 21 year old named Catherine. she was stabbed three times in the abdomen shirley was 24 she was strangled to death by a rope uh, Nancy mm -hmm. was 25. She was strangled by a belt. Maureen was strangled with his hands. Um, Vicky was 28 years old. She was uh, strangled with a nylon stocking, so I'm assuming her pantyhose. And Dolores yeah. was 62, a little 62-year-old. Come on. Strangled with she, pantyhose. I think she was a close neighbor, too. She was like a few houses down. Like This is why I find unusual, too, is the fact that this is all within his... his like within his not neighborhood but town like this is very close to him and that seems even unusual to me because I would think that usually they go like out of their way so it's not even close to where they actually live mm -hmm. and it's but this is like people he's he's run into some of them he knew some he's talked to he interact with on some level whether it was when he decided he decides stalking them or just day-to-day -day stuff and btk stands for bind them torture them and kill them and once again that's not like that's not kinky sex to me if you're if you're trying to you, your ultimate thing is to like kill somebody he like he tries to put like he's tried he, he's done other interviews where he's tried to um what's the word i'm looking for tried mm -hmm. to get understanding and acceptance from like the sadomasochism community which is people that like to do like the dirty thing in the bedroom but like those people don't murder people there's a distinct difference no the no yeah that's the problem it's like there's like there's that big difference between the fantasy where it's two adult consenting adults to can and a fantasy Versus what he was doing, which is this, he went he went outside the fantasy where he wanted to make it reality, and that yeah, that's a no. It's a big problem. Oh. Okay, so another thing I wanted to go over is like they're starting to um, put together clues with different serial killers. So one thing they all have in common is they're smooth talking, but they're still like insecure in some ways. But they they're really good at hiding that insecurity. Um, yeah. This is sort of like saying Ted Bundy wore a mask. So, like, you know, it's crazy to me when, when Ted Bundy's, the movie came out with Zac Efron, everybody on social media was like, why did you make Ted Bundy look hot? Okay, he may not be hot to us in this generation, but, like, I gave the example on a YouTube video. In the 80s, like, the guys were, like, the metal heads. They had, like, the, you know, the big, like, um, curly, like, you know, metal hair and, like, mullets were in style. And, like, oh, you imagine... Yeah. And you imagine yeah. seeing this clean-cut guy and you're like, wow, there's, like, finally somebody that doesn't have, like, the 80s hair thing going on. You know what I mean? Um, and so, I mean, I think they did a great job. A lot of the serial killers, they also have, say, have, um, they're egocentric and they have, like, um, visions of grandeur, like, illusion, which is, like, I'm gonna tie her up and kill her type of thing. Um, mm -hmm. another one is they always lack remorse and guilt, which definitely I saw that with BTK, did you? Oh, yeah, even though when he, he made, he made the effort to try to seem like he did is more like, yeah, you, 
I don't think you quite, it's not connecting. I don't think you actually feel the remorse, even though you're trying to project that you feel remorse. Like in his closing statements, he was trying to act like he felt bad when it's like, no, you don't. No. You, you don't act about this. Well, like I said, watching the interview, BTK, like, you know, the, the judge is asking him questions about like, oh, what did you do? This murder. What did you do? This murder. And he's like, well, mm. and he literally made that face expression. Like, hmm, well, you know. It's gonna sound bad to you, but I'm. But it's what happened, and like I'm okay with this. So, well, this is what happened, and it's just but very they, strange. That that expression sounds that that facial expression is more like when someone asks, "What did you have for lunch yesterday?" Mm. Well, tuna or something. Yeah, like the, you murdered people. Yeah, it was so casual. It's just like what? Yeah, like, and the role playing, the the playing, the the peep, the 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 costumes he put. I think that was to him part of the mask. Mm-hmm. Where he was able to probably be eloquent or more or project a certain um, authority vibe that he was able to get through. Because probably if he just came to the door dressed as he normally dressed, he probably wouldn't have been able to project authority to get into the house. So right. I think that's part of his mask. They also say he has lack of empathy, which is obvious, you know serial killers being able to hurt animals and kids is disgusting um they're deceitful and manipulative and an example of that is obviously john wayne gacy um going to children's parties that's really sick um shallow emotions and they usually end up being kind of narcissistic because i mean if you think about it every serial killer they're doing it for their own pleasure whatever that guilty dark pleasure is they're doing it for themselves that's like total narcissism yeah i can't remember if it's sociopath or psychopath like one they know it's wrong, but they don't care, and the other one doesn't realize it's wrong because they just don't have that capacity. I can't remember which is which. Mm-hmm. Always mix the two up. Um, impulsive behaviors, obviously, if they're able to just take a human and kill him. Poor hum- mm-hmm. um, poor behavior controls, so they don't really know how to human or like bad social cues. Um, and a need for excitement, which is the, some sort of like weird adrenaline rush that happens. There's a lack yeah. of responsibility that's happening. Um, and usually those early behavior problems show up in their childhood, which even with BTK, there were behavior problems that showed up, even if he didn't have any other sort of issues. But another thing that usually comes up is anti, um, behavior, anti-social behavior, which I don't really see that with BTK because everybody really like thoroughly loved them. Thank you guys for the cheers, by the way. No, he seemed like he was very much an extrovert in a lot of ways. I mean, he was a... Uh, Cub Scout leader. He was part, worked part of his church. I mean, he did a lot of social things. He was not a recluse at all. Like he did not do what people typically think um, a circular is, where it's like they they keep to themselves and they hardly interact with anyone else. So I have something funny though. <laughs> Thank you guys for the bits. Um, uh, so he, the the actual proper title that he was the reason the core reason of all of this was he was into auto-erotic asphyxiation. I talked about that. I, I, mm. I'm going to be honest and say I didn't know what it was. <laughs> like, I mean, Google it, but I'm not giving the definition on here, okay, because I don't <laughs> want my YouTube video to get banned later. But um, I Googled it because I, I innocently didn't know what it was, and it, the very first thing that comes up is no. But the doctor <laughs> no. it literally says no, period. It says there is no doctor-approved way to strangle yourself while doing the deed is literally what it says. And I'm like, I didn't, I didn't ask for a doctor's opinion. Like, I was just Googling what it was. Like, it's so funny. I actually uh, Snapchatted that to Kat before the stream. She thought it was pretty funny. Okay, I want to quickly talk about Robert Berdella. And I didn't give any information on, um, on this to Elfie because this was something I just randomly decided to bring up. I actually <laughs> wanted to do this stream on Robert Berdella, but I got him mixed up with BTK. And that's fine. So I was like, I'm going to throw some stuff in here. Um... The question was a couple weeks ago when I was on with Elfie was what is the scariest, um, darkest energy that I get from the museum? Was it the Dybbuk box? Is it Peggy's room who's supposedly like a demon possessing a doll? You know, I think everyone was expecting me to say the Dybbuk box room or maybe like the demon house room. And yes, like those energies are there. Like there's a, I mean, I'm sure Elfie, you feel the same. Is there a distinct difference between a demon energy versus a just angry, ugly human spirit? Do you think there's a difference in energy-wise? Oh yeah, totally. I mean, I think too often we are more we are more hit by 
a dark human energy that we mistake probably for something else. I, th I think that's more likely a case, but yeah, I feel there's a difference. I agree. And the demonic energy to me, I don't know how to word this. I, I'm, I like, I think I get more upset with darker spiritual energy that are like human spirits because we are humans and we understand human emotions easier. So I tend to get more emotionally, like, affected by a dark human spirit than I do a demon. So, like, that's why I was, I don't know, I've always shrugged off. People are like, oh, my God, like, if, what if it's a demon? Da, da, da. Like, eh, I've been around that energy. Like, honestly, it's not what people think it is. How do you feel about it? I'm not saying they're bad. They're not bad. I'm not saying you should, like, go befriend a demon. <laughs> I think, um... The dark energy stuff, I think it's much rarer to encounter, mm -hmm. and um, especially a lot of the places where people feel that there is, I think they're more encountering dark human energy, because, yeah, I think when we have that visceral reaction of, like, I don't want to be here or I want to run away, I think that's because we're encountering a person who is just, you don't want to be next to them, whether exactly. they have this body or not. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Yeah, so, like, when I've been in the demon house room, or I've, and I've been in there, obviously, a lot of times, not just a couple. Um, and same with, like, the demon house, same with the Dybbuk box. Yeah, you know something's in there, obviously. Like, you can feel it. Like, you know, and it's, like, dark. Like, it's demonic. It's dark. But honestly, to me, it doesn't compare to Robert Berdella. That room messes me up. Um, and honestly, even, like, Ed Gein's room, I know this is going to sound strange, but, like, um... Ed Gein was dark, obviously. He was sort of like the Texas Chainsaw Massacre. So I've been around the cauldron that he uh, stripped the skin from his uh, victims. And that's pretty deep, you know, to be around something that is harboring that kind of energy. But honestly, like, I I've said this before, and, like, Ed Gein is not scary, honest to God. Like, he's not. Like, he was a grave robber. He wasn't really, like, into, like, killing humans. Like... I'm not excusing him as a serial killer, but being around his energy, like, I think that's why he follows me home, because I see past the media image that people have built of him. Mm. Now, Robert Berdella, his room, that's a whole nother story. This guy, so if you don't know who Robert Berdella was, he did die October 8th of 1992. He was born January 31st of 1949. He was an American serial killer known as the Kansas City Butcher, or the Collector. He kidnapped, raped, tortured, and murdered um, six men, which there's probably more. I think with serial killers, there's always more that they don't really know about. But he kidnapped oh. these people between 1984 and 1987. Um, he would uh, keep these victims in ca captivity for up to six weeks and basically torture them before he finally killed them. Um, he he'd said that his darkest fantasies were becoming his reality. Um, he couldn't be openly gay, um, so he did it sort of behind the curtain of, like, not letting anybody know. His final victim ended up um, sort of, like, grooming uh, Robert Berdella into thinking that he was uh, one to be in a relationship with him. So Robert Berdella ended up um, trusting the final victim, and then the final victim ended up getting free, and that was mm -hmm. how Robert Berdella was caught. But... So, in the museum, um, I don't know how the items in there were obtained. I don't know. I don't want to know how they were obtained because I think they were, like, police evidence. But there's literally, like, um, the bed sheets of the, the victims that he murdered on the bed sheets. And they're still, like, soiled and bloodied. Oh. And he has, like, a little twin bed set up with that on there. And, I mean, it's, like, obviously very discolored because we're talking about this, like, you know. 30 years ago or whatever. Um, and then Robert Berdella also kept um, diaries, like very extensive diary entries of like all of his tortures. And he has all of the diaries in there on display. This room is effed up. <laughs> like this room's effed up. Um, I that's, that's, had owned his darkness. Like he embraced it and like dived headfirst into it. Yeah, it, it, it's, it's a bad room, in my opinion. Um, now, it's interesting because I, I get, I don't get the same vibes. Okay, it's hard to explain because obviously the Kansas City Butcher, which is guy Robert Berdella, he had rape fantasies with men and, and he was obviously gay and like couldn't be publicly gay, right? So that was where he was like 
um, feeling like he had to like torture people. Obviously, he probably had a messed up childhood. I haven't done a ton of um, background into him. But um, when I'm in there as a strong female, he does I'm not like attacked in that room per se. But it's this feeling of like, oh, you just like shouldn't be here. Like you're you're a strong female. Like you just need to, you just need to get out. And like the longer I stay in that room, it makes him angry. Like it makes him very angry because he wants like vul- I don't think he's crossed over at all. To be honest with you, like I feel Robert Verdella one hundred percent in that room. Once again, all of the rooms in the museum. I think the entities absolutely love the way it's been set up because it makes them feel very at home and comfortable. And so I've I've felt like some serious like of just it's almost like someone screaming at me in my head to like get out of the room and not like my guides but like him like I don't want you in here. So honestly that room and it's all I've always I felt very nauseous when I'm in that room too. Oh, that sounds like he, he's he had he's in his He's in his element. He's in his space, and you're invading that space. He doesn't like because mm-hmm. you're obviously not his mo and everything that mm-hmm. he would go for and whatnot. And I, I'm not surprised because, like, if you have all the stuff, if you have all the energy of all the things he did there, of course he's just going soaking it up and enjoying it because there are people coming there to give energy essentially when they interact with the space and he's probably being like yeah i'm just gonna chill here now there's also a video in that room on a small screen playing of his it's like a 24-hour recording of his court hearing and it just so you just hear robert but like you walk in and robert you literally hear him and see him talking and like all his stuff's there and like the court case and like everything so i mean if I, i don't know if it's because the items in that room are like so personal but then you go in, like, in, like, Ed Gein's room, for example, and, like, I've had other people, like, other girls have gone, Kat's gotten physically sick in that room where she's had to leave. She thought she was going to pass out. Mm-hmm. But, like, once again, like, I've been in that room so many times and around that energy, I get this feeling from Ed Gein, like, oh, my God, Crystal's back. You got you guys, <laughs> what, come on in. How have you been? Like, that's literally how it feels to me. But I'm also not afraid of his energy, like, I'm sorry, Ed Gein, you were just a rob, you know, a grave robber. You're not this, like, scary Texas Chainsaw Massacre person that, like, they made you out to be in the movies. Like, I'm oh, not my. afraid of you because that's not who you really were. So I wish people would look at these these people for what they were versus what Hollywood has made them out to be. Because I, I, Ed Gein's I, just not that tough, you know? I think the problem is that would, pro- that would humanize them too much. And to me, honestly, like... I love horror movies. I love the, the scary movies and everything. And the serial killers, the real ones, like Ed Gay and everything, those ones sometimes, to me, are more creepy because they, these are people. These are humans that actually went out and did these things. This is not the fantasy of Hollywood and everything. And yeah, he, compared to Chainsaw Massacre, he was like, poor guy was broken. Like his Mama's mother- boy. Mama's boy just totally broke him and like when she died he just did not know that what to do with himself he was mm-hmm. just nope well even though like i mean i've been around the charles manson ashes photo too like there was artwork done using charles manson's ashes and i and so there's like a section in the jail area that's just charles manson stuff and even that doesn't give off the vibe like i'm sorry but like charles manson didn't do anything but like puppet everybody around like to me like I see these people for who they are he was kind of a weak ass you know like the only reason that Charles Manson got power is he found other people to like do the dirty work and so I think when you look at these serial killers for what they are they're like damn like she's not like biting the bait like she's not giving off energy that she's afraid of me because like I'm like you're kind of not who you think you are well I think it sounds more like with like um Manson it'd be more like because he he liked to prey on people that he could easily just sweet talk into doing anything like you said and everything mm-hmm. he, he that was his ego trips mm-hmm. along with wanting to become a musician I think so when he's encountered someone that he can probably talk to and you'd be like yeah whatever and not go along with it that he he has nothing to work with at that point mm-hmm. 
He it's just interesting. I just think that if people were around the serial killer's energy, like I've been like in the museum so many times, and it doesn't take just one time. And when you go in there to ex- to fully experience it, I'm not saying go in without your bubble up, but you do have to sort of feel a little bit more reserved and natural to be able to like really feel the energy and understand what's going on. But once you get around these people and their energy, it's not what you would think it is. And I'm not saying to feel bad for a serial killer. I'm just saying to read their energy for what it is. Because even there's some John Wayne Gacy stuff in there too. And like, yeah, it was sick that he did that to kids. But you get around him and like you just feel like he has really sad, depressive energy. Like sad. Like like he... I think in a way wanted to die at the hands of his father and so he was doing it to other kids. I think he just hated his life and hated the way things were and so you just get a different perspective but then you get other people that go in and they're like oh my god it's so scary it's so horrible and you're like well then that's the energy you're gonna read. Well that's that sounds Uh, like it sounds like one of those. I heard a voice in my office just now. Oh no! Yeah, was great. It, it sounded like it was like I said that, and I was like, I heard this like deep man that was like, "Yeah, <laughs> great." Ugh. Oh dear. Um, what I what I was gonna say? It sounds, <laughs> yeah, what did, the, the, the spirit started back like, "Yeah, you go." <laughs> <laughs> when you go into a museum, it sounds like almost. I think the problem we usually have is when you go into these places and I've seen clips of uh, clips of the museum here and there what they allow. Oh shit, and Kat heard the voice. Oh, great. A lot of It was like in this ear, guys. Like I mean, it was so loud like it made me jump cuz like I thought someone was standing behind me. And it, you know that energy when you're investigating and like it's like a push where you're like oh. like it's like a gust of wind. That's how it felt, but it was like behind my ear. So, like, I knew it was going to happen before it happened. It was one of those things. Mm-hmm. And then it was, like, someone's yelling in my ear. I was like, what the hell, yo? Can you just, like, have a seat for a minute? Let me finish the podcast for a second. <laughs> Go ahead, Elfie. So you're saying, like, uh, regarding the energy of the serial killers. Sorry. <sighs> okay. It sounds like someone else wants to have a word in about this. <laughs> I throw their own sense in. <laughs> oh, my God. But what I was going to say with the museum, from what I've least seen from the clips and of whatnot, it's it's very front-loading visual, Gary. Where like you go in, you're expecting, well, I'm going to go see serial killer trophies and and strange photos and this and that and the other. So you're front-loaded already with the impression that you should be picking up on dark energy. Mm-hmm. So I think, like you said, you have to go there more than once to almost kind of like uh, put blinders on to take away the front load in- images that you're seeing and just focus on what's actually there instead of what you think should be there or, or expecting to be there. I also think that I've been lucky being able to be in there for long periods of time because, you know, I, I guess maybe it's because I've been around energy so much my whole life and like investigating isn't scary, but honest to God, going in the Dybbuk box room, like, I feel like that, the two biggest rooms that are most anticipated are, like, the Dybbuk box and the, the Demon House room. Um, honestly, I just find the Dybbuk box room beautiful. Like, it, like, I, it sounds strange, but, like, it looks like hell in there. Like, literally, like, it looks like a pictorial image of what you would think hell would look like. I'm not saying hell's beautiful and that's where I want to go. That's not what I'm saying. I'm just saying that, um, the aesthetic is very pleasing. So I don't get, I do, there's something in there for sure. Like there's for sure something in there. But, oh, I definitely feel like yeah. chill box room just to see. Cause yeah, I agree. It's like when you're doing investigations, if you have a chance to be in a location for not just a few hours, but like returning or go, being there for a few days, you get to actually like climatize and settle into the energy and actually start feeling it instead of just gaining your initial I'm in a place I'm not sure about, or this is spooky, and just getting the gut reaction instead of actually just kind of melding into it. Mm-hmm. I agree. Well, and Demon House is different. That's all told. Like, if you're talking about demons and you're comparing those three, which would be like Peggy the Doll to um, Demon House to Dybbuk, like, they're not going to all feel the same way. 
the mm-hmm. demon house is um, the demon house puts you in a trance. That's how I'm gonna explain it to you guys. If you go in that room and it's happened to Cat too. It even happened to Chanel when she went there. I don't know what it is with the power of the demon house room, but it will trance you out. Like you'll literally just be staring and you don't know how long you've been there. You forget you're standing there. You'll go to leave. You'll turn around and walk back in because you're so tranced by it. So that that to me is more dangerous because it's sort of like drawing you in, you know? And that's more dangerous to me than like the Dybbuk box. Now Peggy, which is like the demon that's inhabiting the, the doll, honestly, she's just like a sassy pants. Like... <laughs> She is like everyone's like oh don't don't piss her off or she'll give you a heart attack or whatever and like I've never disrespected her I don't want to try to disrespect her I don't want to find out what would happen if you did but she just like runs her mouth she cusses a lot through the spirit box she'll tell you to f off like she's just like she's a sassy demon like she just doesn't care like she'll tell you how it is like she doesn't like you in there she'll tell you to leave if she doesn't like you in there I've been in there where she'll literally shut all of the lights off in the room she's probably the most active spirit in there but like i don't think she really leaves that room like i think she also enjoys her like her habitat you know what i mean so, so it, it feels it really does sounds like the, each room which sounds kind of jarring in a way is it's its own little habitat of horror of these each these spirits and you just you're jumping from one to the other and that probably does throw people off when they're moving from one room to the other from like one habit to, to the other mm-hmm. so I just wanted to get that across to people because people have been asking me what my uh what, what I think is the darkest room and, that- and people would assume I'm gonna say something you know one of the demon rooms but it's re- like of course I I mean I like to say I'm of the light side I I'm definitely more interested in the dark side because that's just who I am but um I repel the dark side really badly. Mm. So I must, like, if you're talking, like, energetically, empathic way, if, if you're talking about me interacting with a dark dark energy, my light, I think, is, like, way too bright. Like, I don't know if that means I have a very strong spirit team on the other side, uh, angels, whatever, protecting me, spirit guides. But, like, when I try to investigate demonic activity, like, it doesn't really want anything to do with me. It will do stuff like throw stuff at me or like cuss at me. But like now you have Chanel. Chanel was really into the dark side of things when she was with Ghost Girl Diaries. Man, she like attracted that shit like no other. Like she could go have a full conversation with a demon and it would just chill with her. Where with (laughs) me, it's like I hate you. Get out of my space. Like which is why I'm assuming it's like my, my bright light is a little too much for them. They're like, nope, we're done. Yeah. Nope, not- and now Cat's <laughs> like the total opposite. I'm so sorry, Cat. I'm laughing right now. She's like very bright light. Obviously, you guys can tell. Like, she's definitely like the baby witch of the crew. Hasn't been doing paranormal the longest. But the the dark stuff loves Cat because she's like the baby witch, you know. And she doesn't want anything to do with it. <laughs> And she's the kind that will run from it, and it will follow her. You know what I mean? She, it's like scare houses. She's she would be the one you would see in the middle of the group that all the scare actors would know. Go for that one. Oh. That one looks like, scream the loudest. Hands down, Cat <laughs> is the Aaron Goodwin of the group. Like hands down, like she'll scream and yell. She, she she's cussed the ghosts out a few times. Like get away from her. Like, she's hilarious. Like, her footage is hilarious. So I, if we can get another pilot done, um, she's pretty funny. Like, I think the first pilot, she, would you guys, you know, I'm going to post it online and, and we'll do another chat about that later. But um, she was a little bit stiff in, you know, because it was her first time really being on a film set and really doing it. And she's critiqued herself. I told her not to be so hard on herself. But I think if we get a second pilot down, oh, my God, like she's going to be ready. She's comfortable. She knows what she's doing now. She has that practice under her belt. And she's funny. Like, Kat's hilarious to watch. (laughs) So So hold on is going to be involved for some investigations probably. <laughs> oh man it's so fun. Like I'm the serious one where I'm like shh be quiet. Like listen to what we're doing and Kat's just like there, we had some really bad activity on set. Um, like I mean it was rough. I got called a bitch in the pilot by a, a ghost. It didn't like me. 
Ooh. Oh, yeah. It was, like, in my face, and it was like, bitch. Like, you'll hear that in the pilot. Like, it's some good... I got some good evidence. But... That's good reason. <laughs> but... <Yeah>. then. <laughs> we were in this uh, bathroom, which is where all the activity was happening. And I asked Kat, I said, I just need you to bring me some, like, ghost gear. I need, like, a Mel meter and, like, bring me some stuff over. She, like, scurries in there because she could feel the bad. It was bad. Like, it was dark energy. I'm not saying it was demonic, but it was some dark shit, you know? She scurries in there with the equipment, drops it off, and just takes off running out of the bathroom. She nopes out there, like, yeah, I'm good. You, you. She's like, bye. I'm not messing with this. Well, Where's what? Why is it always in bathrooms? Like, come on, seriously. I don't know, because we actually did not want to um, investigate in the bathroom. Yeah. Because oh, it was God. it was very small, and, like, the house we were investigating was actually, like, literally, like, I mean this actually. The house we were investigating was over a old mine, and over an old copper mine, and it was sliding into the mine. Oh, okay. It was really safe, like 100%. And I did not like the bathroom because you could feel the floorboards sideways because it was actually sliding into the mine. And, Ooh. like, I told them, like, just don't take a lot of time in the bathroom, okay? Like, just, like, I'm scared we put too much weight on that side of the house. It's going to, like, slide backwards. So before we did anything, I actually picked up, like, the shower curtains and got everything out of the way before we investigated. And I think the reason that was such a hot spot in that location was because it was right by the mine. Oh, yeah. If it, it sounds like almost it was, like, at the, the entrance and everything. That would oh. be perfect. It was horrible. We actually had hellhounds show up, too. Oh, wow. It was, and then the lady that owned it, I'm, like, 100% convinced she was an alien, Elfie. I'm not even kidding. Okay. I mean, I, I know that sounds crazy. Like, have you ever met somebody? You're just like, <laughs> damn, you're not human. Like, not even in the slightest. Yeah, no, I, I totally get, like, there's times when... You're not sure what's pinging, but something's pinging, not right. <laughs> Something, there's a red flag here, and it's very large, and I think you're a little green alien, so just take off your human skin and just give it to me as it is, you know what I mean? <laughs> like, that was how it was. It was bad. Like, she she could not, like, you know how normal people will talk to each other face to face? She, she yeah. would literally speak to us and turned her back to us, and it was what? like she, yeah, like, that was the way she conversed wherever she was from. And, like, and she didn't mean it to be rude. And it wasn't, like, some people said, was she autistic? Was she, you know, like, was there a mental disability? No. Like, she was not being mean or rude. Like, she, it was, like, for a second, she forgot to human. Okay. <laughs> well, I, I have some days where I forget to human. So. <laughs> <laughs> That's a mood. <laughs> That's a mood. But, yeah, we were, um, we were investigating. Actually, no, we weren't even investigating. I will share this part. We were um, in the house. And obviously, you know, when you have, uh, you know, four night vision cameras plus a crew, we have mm -hmm. wires running in and out of the house. Like, you know how much investigation equipment is, like, everywhere. You have uh, oh feet, yards of, of cable everywhere. Like, there's cables coming out your ears, like, literally. And so I have the crew setting up all of the cables. We haven't even started filming yet. We're not rolling. Mm -hmm. And we see crew members outside like leap into our SUV like I'm talking like fight or flight like I'm going to die if I don't get in the SUV oh okay and I, we're not even filming yet and Kat like turns around and I'm in the in the house with Chanel and Kat Kat saw it happen and she turns around and does this really creepy thing where she like slams the door shut and holds the door with her hand yeah, that's never a good thing. And I and her eyes are just like f huge, you know what I mean? And and it's nighttime and I'm looking at her and I'm like, "What are you doing?" I said, "Don't close the door because like the crew is out there that we're we're running cave. What are you doing?" She's like, <laughs> "I don't think you want me to do that. I don't think you want me to open the door." And I was like, "Well, then I'm like, we were in a small town. There's like meth heads, like weird stuff going on." I'm like, why, why are you not opening the door? And she was like, there's a huge pack of coyotes. Like, I've never seen coyotes this big in my life. 
Well, yeah, I'd be like, we had so many cords, guys, running in and out of the front door. Because once again, we're filming. Like, we're getting ready for lights out. Like, we're filming. Like, we need this to go. We couldn't close the damn front door. Oh. I know what you mean. It was, yeah, because there's so many cords, we couldn't close the door. So all of a sudden, Kat's holding the door with her hand. And, of course, I'm thinking, like, they're not going to come up to the door. Like, coyotes don't come up to people. Yeah, they avoid people. Now, in the meantime, our crew is in the SUV texting us saying, holy shit, like, I've never seen coyotes this big. Like, they are dire wolf size. Like, there is, like, ten of them be like close the door and i'm like i can't close the door like the door was like cracked i couldn't get it shut so i yeah. literally go running towards cat throw myself against the door with her i mean like literally like all of our body weight was on the door they were outside of the door trying to shove the door open which a coyote would never do that ever no that that is very out, outside of the norm and there was like a pack of 10 or 12 of them trying to push the door open and our crew is texting us saying they have glowing eyes okay and i was like great i'm pretty sure we're dealing with some hellhounds here and i mean they were there for like a while so we did and then i told chanel to grab a camera and record so she was actually she was already hand she was holding a camera she'd already hit record she set Mm. the camera on the table because it was such chaos and it was still running. The EMFs were so high from what I think was Hellhounds. The um, visual cut out of the camera and you could only hear the audio. Oh my goodness. Okay, I kind of want to hear that. And then she's holding another camera. Mm -hmm. And the other camera is her scurrying, running around. So you can Mm -hmm. see like feet and shuffling but the audio went out on that camera. Oh, okay. Is that crazy? Yeah, it was it was really bad. It was not funny. Like that was it, that was dangerous and they were trying to get in the door and it took us a while. Like they waited outside in the SUV. They were locked in the SUV. And um they waited for them to leave. They don't even know which direction they went. They just sort of like disappeared. Yeah, that's very outside the norm because as far as I know, at least now, Gray, I've never encountered one. They avoid people as much as possible. It as was, far as I know. Well, then the lady was telling me, which this is this alien woman, okay, which I did not interview her or put her on camera because it was a nightmare. Like, we're not even going to go there. She, she only spoke one alien language and it was not English, okay? Let's just leave it at that. She was, like, intergalactic, okay? And... She said she had chickens, and she said no matter what she did, no matter she had a chicken coop, she put up wire, she put up fencing, and that these things would still get in and take her chickens. Oh, okay. What's with the farm owls? What's with the grabbing of the farm owls? It was bad. It was really bad. I'm really... And then the last day we were there, there was a drug deal gone bad next door, and we almost died that day, too. It was fun. You know, when you go to these small towns, you never know what you're going to expect. You know what I mean? <laughs> no, that honestly, I, I, I totally get this because there have been some cases I remember where it was not the paranormal you have to worry about. It, it honestly is. <laughs> 100%. It's not. It's it's hellhounds, aliens, and uh, small town people. Particularly yeah, hellhounds. <laughs> that? Yeah. I said, I would love to hear the audio alone on that just because, like, that just is out of this world. Oh, we got some good evidence, girl. Wait till you see it. I mean, we got everything's authentic. Some good shit. Some good shit. Well, Elfie, thank you so much for being with me this week. I appreciate you being here and being patient with our weird audio going crazy earlier and not working out. And um, we'll see you in two weeks. And then next week we have Kat. So thank you, Elfie, so much. We'll see you in a couple of weeks. Bye, everyone. Um, I just wanted to um, have a little chat with you guys and and let you know um, that I'm going to get some videos recorded tonight, and um, I'll get them up on YouTube hopefully this weekend. I know there wasn't an upload this week. Um, I did watch the um, Cecil um, 
episode on Netflix. A lot of people wanted me to watch the docu-series. I did watch it. I have a lot of opinions on it, but that's going to be a whole nother video that I have to film, pre-film and edit for you guys. And um, it's very interesting. I still think Elisa was murdered. I'm going to be honest with you guys about that. I don't like some of the things that they tried to change in the they went to court and it was like the latch first the latch was closed on the water tank then it was open i just i think there was a lot of inconsistencies i still think she was murdered um but we'll chat about my different theories on that when i get around to it and make sure you guys are following us on social media watch for a couple uploads this weekend and as always thank you guys so much for tuning in and i will catch you guys next time bye guys Back from the dead.